What the brooding anemone does is she decides she's going to just keep her young. She's not going to send them out into the plankton to float around. She's going to keep them, and then very slowly they're going to migrate out and about. And it also doesn't mean just because you're poisonous that you, that you can't have interesting relationships with others, right? And so this is, I don't know if you guys can see that, this is a crimson anemone, um, and this is a, a candy striped shrimp that's down in the middle. How many of you guys have seen that movie, Finding Nemo? All right, right. And the relationship at the beginning between Nemo and the anemone, right, is that the Nemo is protected by the anemone, and then the anemone benefits from little pieces of food that Nemo can't keep in his mouth. And it's the same type of thing with this shrimp, too. But when I look at this, I'm like, come on, why didn't they make a movie out of this shrimp? It's much cooler than, than Nemo, right? So we do have all of these cool things that are going on. The next thing I want to go to is kind of the barnacle. So giant barnacle, largest barnacle in the world. 15 centimeters high, 30 centimeters across for the biggest one. And I want to show you these cirri, these, these legs. So basically, they go around as plankton, they attach by their head, and then they take their legs, these cirri, and they kick out. And you can see it in this Pete Naylor picture, you can see them. But let's look at this next video. I think you can appreciate it a little bit better how they come out. And they're, they're just filter feeding, right? Because they can't go anywhere. They can't go out for dinner. So they bring it in as they're coming along. And, and filtering is really important, um, and it's really important to things like water quality. So if I, I always have trouble when I talk about mussels. I say, oh, a mussel can, 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 can filter four liters of water in an hour, and everyone's like, whatever does that mean? So then I found this really great video. And what these people did is a great little setup. On the, they have two 10-gallon tanks with seawater, and then they have a bubbler and sand, and they put in a whole bunch of plankton into the water. Um, same amount on both sides, except they have a dozen mussels. On, on the left, blue mussels, the kind that we have here. And they've sped up the time series on this. So every second that we're looking at equals a real minute over time. So we're about 30 minutes now, and you're already starting to see how they're actually filtering that water. And it's pretty darn cool, and it doesn't, because 40 liters a minute, what, what does that mean? But this is kind of like, oh, 41 minutes, and look what they've done. And you start to think about this, and you know, these guys are providing, they're, they're not just providing a, uh, getting some food for themselves, but they're providing a service for ourselves. And one of the big issues in the Chesapeake Bay, which is another large estuary where there's major re restoration efforts going on, is they've totally trashed a lot of their filter feeding organism. Basically, they have an eastern oyster, and these oysters used to make huge, huge reefs and turn over that water several times a day throughout the Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay is also very shallow huge drainage area. And as they trash that, they trash their ability. And now they even have a thing where one day every summer they have this thing where they, everybody goes out, puts their tennis shoes on, their shorts, their white tennis shoes, and they walk in the water and they see how deep can they go before they can't see their tennis shoes. That's really sad. Like, well, we got 19 inches today. We're doing really well. But it used to be like Puget Sound. It used to be clear water, right? But when you start to mess up these things that are having this important ecosystem processes, and filtering and filter feeding is one of those really important processes that we have. And they also do a lot of other things like fill our bellies, right? So they provide these what we call ecosystem services for us. They clean the water. They fill our belly. Um, they do things like that. And then when we start to have problems, when we're not taking care of areas that we have, we have shellfish closures, then we start losing those services that are available. So we lose the ability to harvest. And it's also a financial um, uh, problem because if we have a $100 million a year cultured selfish industry in, in the Salish Sea, and, just, and that's just on the Washington side, and a third of those beds are closed to harvest at any one time, that's $30 million, $30 million a year that we're losing to the harvest. So that's a really big thing. Another thing that we worry about, it's not really just the... Um, uh, the species that we can consume. It's not the fish, it's not the, um, the shellfish, it's not the crabs, things like that. It's also about watchable wildlife. So in Washington State right now, um, watchable wildlife is about a uh, $980 million a year industry. And when they look at other expenses that people have with traveling and hotels and food, it comes out to be a $2 billion a year interest industry in Washington State. And one of the interesting things is that it, it employs 21,000 people if you pull all those jobs together. So if you pull those jobs together on an industry, watchable wildlife produces more jobs than Microsoft and not quite as many as Boeing. But that's because we have watchable wildlife. We have things that people want to come see and they can see and can enjoy it. So another economic benefit of the ecosystem, I'll give you an idea of, of restoration and why it's important, is this is a derelict fishing gear. These are nets that are lost by fishermen. They don't want to lose them, but they lose them on a rock. And if they don't go back and get them, they continue to fish over time. 
Um, and so we had a project with the Northwest Straits Initiative where uh, people were diving on these uh, nets repeatedly tagging animals to, to learn how long do things stay in the net. So if you pull up a net, you say there was two fish, there was a um, harbor seal, there, there was a couple birds, and there were this many crabs and invertebrates. Well, if we know that guy's been down there for 40 years, we can now back calculate. So we did some modeling with those numbers, and because we had really good numbers for the Dungeness crab industry, we looked at just Dungeness crab alone. So this is what came out of that study. Removal of a net, about 13, maybe $1,380. The amount of Dungeness crab that are killed in a net a year, about $1,900, okay? So that means you remove one net, and the first year you're going to have 50% return on your investment. That's the first year, right? Because those nets made on nylon, they can stay down there for 40 years. So for the next 40 years, you have 150% return on your investment that you already made. I don't know about you guys, but I would invest in it, even if it was a Ponzi scheme. I'd, I'd sound really good to me. You know, so it's one of these things where we realize that, you can go forward, Joe that you know, we have this amazing ecosystem, and I hope tonight you were able to see just some of the, we I mean, just barely touched the surface on some of the cool stuff that's going on. And, and having a healthy ecosystem, is, it's not just about having them for people that like to go watching whales, or it's not just having them about people that like to go fishing. It's really about all of us. And I, got, I like this quote from this book that I just uh, read a couple nights ago by some guys from Seattle. He said, we're all better off when we're all better off. And now what he was talking about was the economy. He was talking about why we need to have a middle class in America, blah, blah, blah. You didn't come to hear that. But I co-opted it because I think it's the true story with the ecosystem. I think we are all better off when the ecosystem's better off. And there's a whole th th thinking right now called One Health philosophy, and it's about having wildlife health and ecosystem health and human health. So I'm a scientist. I have to give you one equation tonight. Healthy wildlife and ecosystems equal healthy people and a healthy economy. And so there was just a valuation that was done by Earth Economics, and they said the value of having a healthy Puget Sound, and this is just Puget Sound, this is not north of the border, depending on the years, if they were to value it as economists, as a business, say you do this when you're going to sell a business, what's the business worth, what's the value, how much does somebody buy it from, they said depending on the year and depending on how it's valued, it's worth between 9 and $80 billion a year to Washington State. That's a lot of money, and it's probably you know, something we should take care of as well, because unlike when you build something, you don't have to, you, if you can fix things, you don't necessarily have to reinvest in that ecosystem to keep it going forward. So, um, so I have some ideas. So how many of you guys are kind of, I always ask, how many people are against a healthy Puget Sound? <laughs> okay, because the devil's in the details. It's really about all what you want to do. But you guys, we're all interested in that. So I got some ideas, a little rubric on some things that we can do. First one here is pretty straightforward. Um, you want to make a difference, get educated. Okay, you guys are here. You guys are involved in beach watchers. You guys are working at Camp Orkila. Uh, you guys are taking people on kayak trips and educating them. It's really critical. Keep getting educated because just like all the things I showed you tonight, you can always find something new about something you thought you knew everything about, and it makes it even that much cooler as you're going along. Okay? So the second one, talk about why it's important. People talk about everything. And what people hear is what people are always thinking about, okay? What do people talk about in Seattle? Traffic, right? People talk about economics, the economy. We need to be out there talking about a healthy ecosystem and what benefit a healthy ecosystem and what cool things are out there in the ecosystem. You know, this needs to be the chitter-chatter that goes around, and that's what gives the political capital and the will to actually get things done, to say, hey, you know, I'm really not a big, big on whales or birds or whatever, but I actually realize that investment in the ecosystem is investment in our economy, so I'm actually for that. Those types of things that are going on. Okay? The other thing is let people know you care. Because you know, if, if you don't actually tell people, hey, this is something I'm, I'm interested in or I care about, then nobody really knows. And you can have, your heart can be in the right place, but nothing's getting done. So you know, I tell people, Take a sticker, put it on your water bottle. Let it remind you every day that this is something that's important to you. It's just like, you know, if you have a picture of somebody that you love in your mirror and you look at it every morning and you think about that, it just sets your, your day straight. It's the same thing that you can do with other things that you love. If you love the having a healthy ecosystem, put something out there that reminds you about it, reminds you to take care of it and to talk about it. And then the last thing, invest in what you love. Okay, we're all familiar with investments. We just talked about one simple investment of removing derelict fishing gear. We need to invest in something. If we want to have this, we need to invest in it. We need to have our legislatures invest in it. We need to invest in it in the types of things that we do. So that's about all I have. I want to thank Joe and Jean and Nancy for helping me out with a lot of these slides and ideas. And I'd be happy to answer a couple questions, but not too many because it's almost 8 o'clock. <laughs> Thanks a lot.
Yeah, Bob. What's the current thinking on sonar, particularly like that killer Oh, I knew somebody was going to ask me that. <laughs> okay, so what's the current thinking on sonar? So we just, uh, if you don't know, there was a southern resident, a three-year-old named L112 that, that uh, died uh, last month, and we just finished looking at the necropsy and everything that's going on. Died of massive trauma, had trauma all over his head and neck and, and, um, and inside and the fat inside of its jawbone and stuff like that. And an uh, article just came out saying this animal is blasted away by sonar. But what I want to distinguish is that sonar is a sound. It's not a blast, okay? And a sound, if you've ever taken Brett McFarland's physics class, sound is a wave, right? It has a wave property. And what happens with sonar and what we think happens, and we're just starting to understand the impact of sonar on marine mammals and where and why and when and how what it does. What we think happens is that wave comes and hits an animal. And then it causes resonance of the structures themselves. And where you have a soft tissue and an air interface are areas where you can actually have breaking of blood vessels and trauma and places like that. It's different than what happens with a blast, which is also kind of a wave, but it's a different type of a process that happens. And so in this animal, um, we're still trying to figure out what's going on. But the evidence right now shows massive trauma all over the body. And it's, I would say right now, it's not necessarily consistent with sonar, but we still got some more evidence to weigh on that one. And the important thing to remember is that we use science to understand what sonar can do and when sonar can happen. We're not anti-sonar or anti-Navy or anything like that because, you know, recognize we, we need to have the Navy, we need to have Homeland Security or whatever for rogue subs. But what we can do is we can understand when it's a problem, and where it's a problem, and then if we have the option on when we're going to use it, we can use it in a place that's safe to use it. And that's part of the process that's going on. That process started in this area uh, a few years ago when the USS Shope came through Harrow Strait, and we had about 15 harbor porpoise that stranded after that. We didn't actually pin it on sonar. We said we can't rule it in, can't rule it out. We didn't have any friends the next day because we didn't make anybody happy with that one. But basically, it started the conversation between the Navy and NOAA and other groups to say, hey, we do need to start thinking about this. And I think that whatever is going on right now will continue and forward that conversation. One of the big things is, what about critical area? The whole area that was designated as critical area for the southern resident killer whales is inland waters. It's not out, outer waters. And so we're learning because of animals dying out there, and regardless of what they die of, and because of tags like that one they put on the J-Pod member, that those animals are going out there. And we probably do need to start thinking about redesignating critical habitat for that. So that's probably a longer answer than you wanted. All right. All right, thanks a lot, you guys.